Cuba, United States, and Israel were the two voting against. Um, you didn't allude to who may or may not have abstained, but that's not important. Uh, the point is that uh, the sanctions and condemnations against Israel, uh, that basically, um, what kind of moral yardstick do you think the United Nations is when basically it's just a body of delegates uh, selected by non-democratically chosen governments, driven obviously by self-interest and not moral altruism? So how can we really judge Israel or any other country based up against moral, uh, based up against the United Nations resolution? That's the first question. The second one is you argue that the rich lifestyle of the Israeli society is essentially supported by uh, the United States taxpayer. Um, we know that it's something like $3 billion a year that the United States supplies to Israel. That's about $600 per capita, enough maybe to buy a Nintendo, a nice stereo system, if you're not spending it on, de on defense-related uh, costs. Um, the economy in Israel uh, is about $70 billion. It's growing at about 7% per year. I really don't see how that's uh, more than just a small subsidy at this point in time, and it continues to uh, erode with time as well. Um, how can you argue that the Israeli economy is totally dependent on Israel's support? Those are my two questions. Uh, well, the, as far as the United Nations is concerned, there were uh, countries that abstained, uh, all of whom condemned the United States. Uh, and we don't have to worry about the UN. We can ask about countries like Canada, England, uh, and so on, and ask what their opinion is. I don't know if they're democratic by your standards. Uh, but if they are, uh, they bitterly condemned uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, the US uh, embargo. And indeed, so did George Bush. In fact, when the uh, Torricelli bill, which is what they're talking about, this bill which was designed to increase the embargo and to cut out about 90% of what it cut out was out of food and medicine, uh, it was vetoed by George. It was proposed by the Liberal Democrats. It was vetoed by George Bush. The reason being it was so obviously contrary to international law that George Bush was opposed to it. Uh, when it came up in the United States, it it, he passed it anyway because it was outflanked from the right by Clinton during the uh, 1992 election. So they passed it. Uh, it was uh, immediately condemned by uh, the Democratic, by our Democratic allies, I should say, by the Western Hemisphere, of course, uh, the British ambassador who is usually at the UN, who's usually so loyal to the United States, he practically, you know, I suspect he gets handed his messages from Washington. He got up and bitterly condemned it, though finally they abstained. They don't like to s step on the toes of the United States that openly. Uh, so in fact, world opinion on this goes from, includes, say, Britain, Canada, you know, George Bush, and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, but we do we do know we do know what the well, we do know the voting record, and we do know what our allies, uh, our democratic allies, felt. They bitterly condemned it because it's so obviously contrary to international law. Okay, uh, that's uh, on on the on the case of uh, uh, on the case of the 101 to two vote. There was one country that was willing to stand up against all of world opinion on this, including the democratic societies, namely our. Uh, subsidized client. Uh, and that's true on case after case. Uh, for example, the United Nations uh, passed, the Security Council passed a resolution a few years ago calling on all states to, uh, to observe international law. They didn't mention any particular state in question, but everyone knew who they meant. It was right after the World Court had ordered the United States to stop its, uh, Ill, its as they put it, unlawful use of force, meaning in uh, international terrorism against uh, Nicaragua. The U.S., of course, totally rejected the, uh, uh, the opinion. It then went to the Nicaragua and took it to the Security Council of the United Nations, uh, which voted uh, to call on all states to support international law. The U.S. vetoed it. It then went to the, uh, in, uh, to the uh, General Assembly, where there's technically no veto, uh, and uh, the General Assembly passed a resolution calling on all states to, uh, to uh, adhere to international law, mentioning no one, but the implication was understood. Excuse me a second. Excuse me a second. I, you asked your question, now I'm answering it. Uh, the U.S. was able to pick up one vote. Uh, well, actually, the first time it came, the U.S. was able to pick up two votes, the United States and El Salvador, uh, uh, agreeing, uh, objecting to obeying international law. Uh, the second time it came, the U.S. was able to pick up one vote, Israel. And if you want, if we had time, I'd go on and on. Now, you know, if your standards are that the only expression of decent human opinion is the state of Israel and the U.S. government, yeah, you have a position. If it's anyone else, if, well, if it includes, for example, the uh, votes of Canada, England, France, uh, other uh, Germany, on and on, 
uh, saying, say, that you should uphold international law if it includes the world court, then you're, I'm afraid you're off the wall. On the second issue, uh, if you want, uh, first of all, the $600 a year is absolutely not true. U.S. subsidies to Israel amount to, at the very minimum, $1,000 per capita. Israel gets more from, and that's at the minimum, if we don't consider subsidiary costs. Like, for example, one subsidiary cost, which is not counted, uh, is uh, contributions to Israel. Uh, you can give money to the Jewish National Fund in the United States and the United Jewish Appeal, and that's tax deductible, meaning everybody in the country pays for it. And that money goes for the kinds of things that Israel Shachak was talking about. For example, if you look at the contract of the Jewish National Fund with the State of Israel, uh, originally signed in 1953 and then renewed, what it says is that, that the money that they spend can be used, I'm quoting, for people of Jewish race, religion, and origin only. Okay, that's you, American taxpayers are therefore paying quite substantial sums to the state of Israel uh, for actually to, an, to a quasi-official agency. Uh, Israel likes to farm out these activities so that they don't literally fall under the government, uh, which is then used for the benefit of people of Jewish race, religion, and origin. And we can go on with that. If you want an authoritative uh, analysis of the effect of this uh, from a very pro-Israeli scholarly source, uh, you can turn to uh, down the river to Nadav Safran, uh, I guess is originally Israeli, judging by, I don't know if he is or not, he's an Israeli scholar who uh, was a major uh, Middle East scholar who wrote one of the sort of standard works on uh, the United States and Israel, standard scholarly works, and he points out there that up until the time he wrote, I forget what year it was, he says all of Israel's capital formation came from external sources meaning uh, basically the United States, very, a little bit from German reparations, but primarily the United States. And that was long before the major uh, contributions. That was before U.S. so-called aid to Israel shot up in the 70s. In 1978, uh, Jimmy Carter raised it to literally 50% of total U.S. aid. Uh, in fact, if you cut out U.S. aid, uh, the, the United States happens to have, be, have the, the most miserly record in the developed world in foreign aid. That's literally the case. Uh, but if you cut out the aid to Israel, a rich country, the U.S. isn't even there. It's kind of like around Zambia in absolute terms. Uh, and, uh, uh, this, uh, but, and this is a huge flow of aid. There is no country in the world that gets a fraction of it. Uh, sometimes Israel's called it like a state of the union, but that's wrong because there is no state of the union that even gets a fraction of the uh, uh, contribution that comes from the taxpayer to the state of Israel, and that's an enormous factor in their, uh, in, in their economic growth. As I say Safran called it the equivalent to entire capital formation. Uh, that, that's why Israel's a rich country. There's been a request for people to ask their questions from the first step, that way they can be on the video and audio. By the way, Nadav Safran uh, uh, had a, hosted a conference uh, on, behalf of, on behalf of the CIA. Just stay in line if they're going to make a statement, so please. This is just a side light about Nadav Safran. Yeah. Yeah. Can you guys hold on? <laughs> Yes. Yes. First of all, it did have a great effect. Only the immigration has ceased about two years ago. The immigration, um, uh, and uh, uh, by the way, to add to comment of Noam Chomsky, the two billion uh, of guarantees are actually now uh, sitting in a Swiss bank and bearing 7%, uh, uh, bearing 7% because the immigration has stopped. But it is very true that the immigration has caused two effects. One, that most of those people are uh, secular. And it is very true that some of them are not Jews, and some of them uh, have now, are now uh, living a religious life in Greek Orthodox uh, Church. 
Well, yes, there, is, there, are now, uh, there are now two churches in Israel who call themselves Jewish Christian churches. One is the Greek Orthodox, it's another Catholic church who say mass in Hebrew and regard themselves as Jewish Catholics, but I don't know what the ideology and government uh, will do with this. Uh, but there is another factor which they cost. They are very poor by now, because Mr. Rabin happens to be the prime minister who is the most devoted to the economic ideas of Mr. Reagan, more than I would say Mr. Shamir before him, and more before um, uh, any other prime minister. Let me just point in substantiation of the fact that during two and, uh, years and few months, that Mr. Rabin is prime minister, the average price, price of housing in Israel rose by 56%. Uh, imagine such a thing happening in... Uh, because of this, you have a conflict between the, their secularity and their being abjectly, to great extent, abjectly poor. The long-term effect, I think, will be uh, that they will very strongly, uh, the long-term effect, I, are, I have to add other factor, and there, I think, great devotion to basic democracy, not to all democracy, big democracy caused by the revulsion of the reform of the Soviet regime, will certainly be that they will support, uh, uh, that they will be against tradition and more for democracy. It's been requested that the questions be paraphrased, or very well, I will pass. Very well. I have, a, I guess, a two-part question. To one me? Is, yeah. Please. Uh, one is that um, you've described the uh, Orthodox tradition in uh, a Jewish tradition, but certainly there are many other, there are many, there, there's a diversity in Jewish traditions, uh, so that while one may be dominant at one time, uh, there are many other traditions that go on as well not just Jewish traditions, but radical traditions that, uh, for example, European Jews carry, uh, and, and which certainly must exist in Israel. But the other part of the question is this, uh, maybe the more important one is, you know, maybe we could talk a little bit about that. Uh, but the most important thing, I think, is that from a practical point of view, running an apartheid state uh, creates a tremendous drain on the people who are in power, and uh, as Professor Chomsky pointed out, there's no uh, d dominating a, a reason from, for example, the American point of view why the Palestinians shouldn't be productive in their own way in the, in the world system that's come about. They don't have to be uh, poor in Gaza to, uh, to, be, to, to fit into that framework. So uh, is it a hopeful situation from that? Yeah. Yes, I think, uh, ah, yes. The first question was, uh, in the, there is certain orthodox tradition, but there is a diversity of modern radical traditions existing in East Europe. And it is true, I, I, and should I discuss it, it's true this an omission of my part. And the second running at apartheid states creates a drain uh, on people who are running that state, and I suppose it will be for further development of um, idea that it will be in Israel of the interest not to run an uh, apartheid state, even if it wants to, uh, to govern the territories. You are right about my omitting the radical and uh, traditions of Eastern Europe, this was because of the demand of time. I jumped from orthodoxy, which I said was universal uh, ruling uh, the Jewish people until about 200 years ago, and I omitted the revolt against, I said about something about reform and conservatives, but I omitted the fact that certainly many, uh, there was a Jewish working class movement, there were many parties, there was a, 
Uh, the whole literature created in Yiddish and in Hebrew in Eastern Europe is a rebellious literature. It's me, the, some of its greatest creations are utterly rebellious. Uh, it still continues in Israel and gives also to people like me part of their strength. I omitted it because all this was not possible in Orthodox Judaism before liberation of outside, and because those who are putting Jewish tradition above democracy are also against this part of uh, Jew modern Jewish tradition. They are, to give you only American example or something conflicting between America and, uh, and Israel, the famous play Fiddler on the Roof has been really, in my opinion, falsified from a wonderful book of Shalom Aleichem, a wonderful writer in Yiddish whose work are, are faithfully translated into Hebrew and which are known by every lover really of Jewish culture and of both literature. If you go to most Jewish libraries or general libraries in this country, you will not find a Sholem Aleichem, a, book, a writer whose books were literally once published in millions, in many millions, because he's very critical about Jewish tradition, because in the novel from which Fiddler of, Fiddler of the Roof was made, he makes fun and satirizes the Jewish tradition, while Fiddler of the Roof is a saying, a song of price to tradition. So you see, it is true I omitted, I pointed to this, but I make it, I thank for the question, and certainly we are in a part, uh, we are a, pa a continuation of this tradition. But in the form of which it was replanted in Palestine, this critical and radical tradition carried a flaw. A flaw meaning the that the idea of Jewish rule, Jewish full possession, I should say, not rule, ownership of Jews, of all the Jewish nation, of land of Israel, was taken by the first settlers and by Zionist movement straight from tradition, jumping over all, uh, all those radical and very positive tendencies. Here I can find the best explanation in one of our jokes, because we Israeli Jews continue the radical tradition of the Jewish joking. Maybe, uh, and the joke, very famous in Israel, may be considered, I don't know what, self-hating or anti-Semitic in here in the United States, but nevertheless, all Israeli Jews, or most of them, know the joke that there are some Jews who don't believe that God exists, but who still believe that God gave to the Jews the ownership of the land of Israel. <laughs> so this will explain to you that some secular Jews could secularize the parts of the Jewish tradition and religion and use them in a very, in for very good secular benefit. It always reminds me of that saying, which was uh, of Voltaire, that when he uh, asked whether he wants his servants to be of his religious opinions, he said, no, no, I, all my servants must be faithful Catholics because otherwise they will steal from me. <laughs> so uh, here, you have, uh, here you have something, I think, which is very similar. Now, um, about the second, it is true to conduct apartheid state is a drain. It is a drain which is, uh, which is uh, I think, becoming greater because so many Israeli Jews are traveling to other countries, especially in the last 10 years, and are coming with the sense of observing what they have, uh, what, uh, what they have seen. Nevertheless, uh, it continues, it is now a little, it is now to some extent shaken in domestic affairs. It is a drain which on the other, which on the other part has a satisfaction in the totalitarian mental attitude peculiar of a true believer. A true believer which believes in 
all this is like in case of course of Christian true believers, Muslim true believers, Buddhist true believers, every <laughs> communistic true believers in the same way has the sense that he has all the answers from the past. Wise men of the past have decided what is correct, I simply have to follow, I have my own interpreter. I am very much afraid that uh, this feeling of happiness and certainty can compensate for the drain. you made about Israel, I think there is a half-truth or completely non-truth. I accept your understanding of the statement because you are an Israeli citizen. However, as somebody who is not a member of the Jewish religion, at least not the religious organization or, the, or follows the Jewish belief, I do not think you have the right to do this vilification of the Jewish religion. And I don't think his opinion should be taken with more credit. those opinions can be taken with more credit than the opinion of members of Operation Rescue on doctors perform abortion. Thank you. Thank you. I will point, uh, I will point that the first critics of Christianity and of its treatment of uh, Jews were Christians. And the opinion now said would, uh, if logically followed, that, let us say, Voltaire, whom I now who quoted now in adversant, that his critique of Christianity should not be translated to Arabic and published, let us say, in Egypt, because of the same principle. If the principle that the, that the person who made the statement is tended to be universal, I have with him a disagreement. But if he will say that while Critique of Judaism would not be, should not be made in Israel, but critique of Islam, where Islam, I think, is much more denigrated here than Judaism and much less power should be, then I have a much deeper disagreement with him, and everyone should choose the view that he prefers. Please. Yeah, still a lot of Being a friend, and that's not what we do. Uh, no, I said about Egyptian who is telling the Egyptians about Voltaire's opinion of Christianity, while Christians in, Fre in Egypt are a minority. And, and maybe a minority not in such a good condition. And what is more, I am saying this because lack of criticism of Judaism is causing the oppression of Palestinians. It's one of the most important causes of oppression of Palestinians, which without United States support will not proceed very much. Please. Yes, the question was what is happening uh, after Oslo, particularly in terms of land confiscation. Uh, what is the fate of settlement, whether it increases or not increases, and what the settlers are doing in Kirat Arba and otherwise. Let me, t there are more uh, land confiscation. Land confiscation go is going on after uh, Oslo, uh, all the time as well. In fact, it's increasing. I didn't mention it because I think that if the amount of land of confiscated in, uh, will increase from 70 to 71 percent or 72 percent, it will not be a great difference. 
I think that the fate of empty lands is much more significant. I am, of course, very aware of the suffering of persons of whose land was confiscated. But uh, I think that he, the most important problem is to see this, uh, is to see the, in general terms. And in terms of apartheid, additional confiscation of land are additions to apartheid, and it so should be put. The important fact is that apartheid exists. Now about the settlements. Actually, there was a limitation of our settlements, and it was due to Mr. Bush. A few months after attaining power in September 1992, Rabin visited Bush, and they came to an agreement in which uh, uh, agreement which Rabin accepted only after some strong pressure from Bush that the settlements will be divided, that first of all, no further settlement will be established. This was a great concession, maybe not important in apartheid terms, but under Shamir and Sharon, of course, many settlements, maybe, uh, maybe not effectual, maybe not this, but every new settlements were established uh, all the time. From that time, the settlements are divided into two parts political and non-political. In the so-called non-political settlements, as agreed between Bush and Rabin, settling goes on between a settlement expands, but no new is being built. Uh, and in the other category, Israeli government ceased to give the enormous support that it, uh, uh, gave, uh, that it gave formerly. Uh, in, uh, it does quite a lot of, uh, it does give quite a lot of money, but I think that most of that money in the year after Oslo is being spent on demonstrating against Israeli government itself, as fully documented by Hebrew press and not on the settling purposes. Well, um, about Kiryat Arba and the settlers and what has been done now, I, uh, I, can, I will say in general terms that the situation in Hebron has not become better, and that I can refer you to a long article about this, which those of you who received my translations, whether directly or through um, from, uh, from my publication uh, here in the United States, can read it for themselves. But I will also tell you that the oppression of settlers in Hebron and Kiryat Arba are a minor part of oppression carried by Israeli army. That we should not uh, remember that the main work of oppression is carried by army and by Israeli soldiers and reservists, and of course by the civilian authorities of the state, the civilian administration and so on. It is the state that oppresses. It is true that the state is using the settlers, especially around Hebron and Kirarba, in additional oppression. And on this, I will only answer the question in one respect, which will, excuse me for being selfish, uh, emphasize the point that I made about the rule of law. Uh, about uh, at the beginning of this year, in January, there was a discussion in Israeli media, in radio, press, and television, what Israeli army can do when a settler from Kiryat Arba points his gun at a Palestinian with, the in with intention, possible intention, to shoot at him. A colonel from Israeli army actually uh, stationed actually a vice command, deputy commander of brigade stationed in Hebron, appeared on Israeli TV, his words were then reproduced by Hebrew press, and said, if I will witness such incident, the only thing that I can do is to run as quickly as I can and to shield the Palestinian with my body, because the standing orders of the Israeli army uh, prohibit me from doing anything else. Prohibit me, let us say, from disarm the settler before he was 
he, uh, he, uh, he fired. After he fired and wounded, he can be disarmed, but not before this. This is, of course, of, I, can, I really don't need to emphasize that uh, in case of a Palestinian shooting at anyone, of course, the directions are quite different. This will show you how the rule of law, even in the most basic sense, doesn't exist in territories officially. After the Shamgar Committee report, which condemned this order and asked that it will be abolished, practically nothing was done. Not so much because settlers are powerful, because, but because this order is one of the outward signs of the apartheid. Please. Begin, I will begin with the second part of the question. This is about the incident I actually mentioned in the book that I witnessed myself in 1965 in Jerusalem, in Katamon, in the street called Yoash Street, very near a yeshiva there and very near my house. Uh, the, that a religious Jew, as shown, known to me, by the way, since it was my own neighborhood, refused to, to, uh, to use his telephone, to use his telephone, telephones were then relative rare in the neighborhood, in order to call an uh, ambulance for, uh, saving, um, uh, for saving this. Then I will go about Voltaire and the Jews. His name, please. His name. One moment. Uh, the I am name? in the middle of answering the question. What is his name? 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 I am. What is his name? What is his name? After witnessing. I am answering in my own name, and I am not used, especially in Israel, to submit to Jewish Nazis. <laughs> now, I didn't publish this after witnessing the incident. I went first to the rabbinical court of Jerusalem. I obtained from the rabbinical court of Jerusalem a statement that a Jew should not violate Sabbat in, to, in order to save non-Jewish life. With this statement I went to Haaretz, not with the incident. And I made scandal not about the incident, but about a statement of rabbinical court of Jerusalem signed by three rabbis. This was the scandal. 
It is not true, Immanuel Jacobovich, which, which somebody quote here, is a well-known liar. And because of this, and be, he was chosen by Margaret Thatcher as her great supporter. Because of this, he was made a lord. And I would say to you that if you look into his book, Jewish Medical Ethics, not into his text, but into his biography, you will find biography, you will find in the bibliography articles in Hebrew which don't appear in the text, which say again and again, with literature again being brought in the Hebrew press, in Hebrew literature, and by the way, by professors in bar -Ilan University, that a religious, meaning Orthodox Jew, should not violate Sabbath in order to save a non-Jewish life, except when it is for the benefit of Jews or for averting a danger of them. This is the answer to the question. Yes, and I will not. <laughs> and I will not, yes, I answer the question in... in and, and your and your being now and very well the question will not go away and you practically agreeing that Jews will not save Jewish life. You now not saying anything about the statement of the rabbinic court of Jerusalem will also not go away. Both things will not go away. Now about, I will also, I will also answer about Voltaire. What is his name first? Voltaire. <laughs> I will also, because I don't want to answer the questions of a Nazi. And, what, and by the way, if question saying about the name, why the cowards who published this about Noam Chomsky and Israel Shahak didn't put any name to this? <laughs> if they are speaking of... If they are so much about the name, why you will not find here any name or address, a phone to which one can refer? I wrote that. I wrote that. My name is John Haber, by the way. And what is your... <laughs> now about Voltaire. It is true that Voltaire made many offensive statements about, and about many groups, including the poor, as I quoted. It is true that, Jew, that Voltaire has generalized about the Jews in offensive matter. It is also true that not only he didn't want the, them not to be burned, but he fought against any discrimination of them and that he opposed any case of injustice to them. Voltaire is also very uh, abused uh, Christian religion and Protestant religion, especially in the most atrocious way. But when there was a case of a Protestant named Calas, he protested against his execution in the, uh, in the way, in, uh, in the greatest way of which he was capable. I will therefore say about Voltaire and about every great man that we have to put his expression of, uh, first of all, we have to see how much he hated a special group. There is a very great difference between a hating special group so that one should not, let us say, uh, allowed the use of telephone or other instrument on Sabbath in order to save them. And there is a very great, much, a great difference between only abusing that group. I am afraid that abusers of human groups will exist in every society. What I demand, I didn't speak to you one word about those who are worshiping Goldstein. 
I didn't speak to you one word, but now in answer to Voltaire, I will, about rabbis right now who are justifying Goldstein murders and more than Goldstein murders. My answer to quotation about Voltaire will be another quotation which you can read actually in your library because it's from Jerusalem Post, 7th of October of this year, 1994-4. And it concerns a rabbi called Ido Elba, who was so racist that he was even indicted by the Israeli authorities. Quote, according to the indictment, El Rabbi Elba circulated a 14-page halachic pamphlet entitled Clarification of the Halachot, religious rules, pertaining to the murder of Gentiles. According to Kiryat Arba sources, this pamphlet was circulated after Baruch Goldstein killed 29 Arabs in the Machpelah cave. In the summary of the back page headline for the study but not for practice, Elba allegedly wrote that the biblical injunction, thou shalt not kill, is not applicable to a Jew who killed a Gentile, and this is not forbidden according to the Torah. Elba also wrote that there is a mitzvah, a good deed, to kill Gentiles who are devoted to religions that deny the fundamentals of Jewish faith and the eternity of the Torah, and who, like missionaries and Muslims who believe in jihad, believe that they are commanded to persuade others to join their religion. This mitzvah, good deed, Elba wrote, is applicable when Jews have in their power to do this and when they do not have to fear from the rest of the world. End of quotation. I will first emphasize I didn't say one word about this in my presentation because I emphasize to you that the most important things are done by the power of the state with the full consent of the citizens. In the same way, it is not the incident that I witnessed. The answer is I didn't ask the name of the person, but the ruling of rabbinical court represented by state, which is important. Uh, Shabbat pertaining to saving anyone's lives. But in the end, the result of many debates is that you must save the person's life. And I don't know which sources you're choosing to quote here, but that, that is what I've learned from many, many places. Well, I, I will here answer that your statement is strictly untrue. In cases of danger to Jewish life, all means should be done, including violation of Shabbat to save Jewish life. And uh, if you want an argument, you can sh buy my book. You can, which is, in, <laughs> you can offer it to rabbis and let the rabbis answer it. Yes. Yeah. And, but I still know that after you asked me a question after I quoted you one single rabbi. You didn't say that you oppose him. You didn't say after I quoted now something shocking in the name of Rabbi who is indicted by the state of Israel itself. You could open your statement that whatever other rabbis say, you oppose this rabbi. You don't didn't do it. All right, all right, very well. Then the uh, Christians who support Inquisition can use your argument too. Okay, well, being Jewish, I'll preface my statement that I think that rabbi's comment is repugnant. But going on, I have a comment, not a question. Um, Dr. Shahak, uh, your presentation, I use that term fairly loosely, 
is to me a cesspool of uh, misinformation and distortion. I have two comments against this backdrop. First, to the audience, please do not take what he's saying at face value. Go out, research the topic, go to the library, see if reality corroborates what this guy is saying, and let the facts be my witness. This guy speaks the truth about as often as Haley's Comet visits Earth. More importantly, I have this to say to you, sir. At being Jewish, when you use personal pronouns such as we and us, when you talk about the Jewish people, I have a visceral reaction. I say to you what, what, uh, what Prime Minister Rabin said to Barbara Goldstein after the heinous massacre at Hebron, and that is we spit you out with every bit of power we have. Thank you. I will certainly agree. I will certainly agree with the first part of the statement. Go on and research. Make your own research and see. Very well. Uh, I will point out that although Rabin made this statement about Baruch Goldstein, he didn't make this statement about the many rabbis and other religious figures who supported Rab uh, Baruch Goldstein. And in either case, uh, in any case, I am against spitting out any member from any, uh, uh, from any nation on authority of prime minister or president. <laughs> and, but if you want to spit me out from Judaism that you represent, then the feeling is mutual. <laughs> I'd like to preface my question first with the statement that I am an Orthodox Jew and I disagree with the rabbi that you have quoted. Now, to get to the question, <laughs> I uh, would like to say that uh, I think you have an incorrect, inaccurate assessment of what apartheid is. Apartheid, in other words, is a system of persecution of a racial or ethnic group. In Israel, there is no apartheid. There are over 100,000 Arab citizens of Israel with voting rights who receive services from the tax they pay. Uh, there are also Arabs who serve in the parliament. Why don't you ask them? <coughs> now, you can say that the treatment of the Arabs who live in the territory is bad, it's unjust. But I think uh, what you're doing by calling that an apartheid state, and there are Arabs who do have rights in Israel, doing a service to those who fought against apartheid in South Africa. Just as I think when you're calling someone in the back row and yelling, yelling out something, you call that person a Nazi, I think you're doing a service to six million Jews who were killed by Nazis. You are lucky you survived, six million people didn't. Well, the... The fact, that, uh, er, the fact that Arabs, by the way, many more than 100,000, the number of Arabs in Israel is about 850,000, have voting rights and many other rights, and they sit in parliament, is very true, doesn't change the, territory, the situation that a colonel in Israeli army, as I said again and again, who of course has a voting right, cannot use 70% of the land of, West, uh, of uh, West Bank. I emphasize, even in this one respect, that in the Israeli army there are very many Palestinians who reach quite high positions. But since you began with this, I am saying something more about it. Uh, which means that although I will not uh, call State of, in, uh, State of Israel proper, I will uh, uh, apartheid, but I will say that it has some apartheid elements. The word apartheid in full sense should be reserved for the conquered territories. Now why? Uh, because, let us say, the people who serve in the army. Uh, about a year and a half ago, when President Ezra Weizmann was elected, he wanted to nominate a 
a Druze to be a Druze colonel, a retired colonel, to be one of his officials in his presidential mansion. The, uh, uh, the authorities, in the sense the secret police, objected on the ground that every non-Jew, whatever the rank in the army, is suspect to some extent. President by Israeli law has access to all secrets and all information. After some argument in which president tried to persuade the secret police, um, he accepted their argument and the man was not nominated which means that the border of apartheid or aspects of apartheid are much lighter, but they are there. If the same argument would be employed in the United States, then uh, Henry Kissinger could not become se uh, uh, Secretary of State. Therefore, the situation, even in Israel itself, is more close to South Africa than to the United States. By this differentiation on uh, about religion, about this. Now I will, uh, uh, I will point to you that there are many uh, uh, discriminations in Israel, lighter than uh, in, uh, uh, in South Africa or the territories, but conversion, religious conversion will abolish them all. Because of this, I think that yet you, one can use in, about Israel this statement about uh, aspects of apartheid or something else, and it fully applies in the territories. Now about my use of the term Nazi. This was invented by one of my friends and teacher, General Leibovitch, many years ago, who used the term Judeo-Nazis very often. And it referred to the fact of denial of common humanity in this, not only to Baruch Goldstein and such an act. Common humanity means to denial of basic facts which even colonial regime is granting or which came to pass during the uh, invasion of Lebanon or during the Israeli support to Guatemala and many things. I think that the fact that Jews uh, have lost six million during the Holocaust. I am myself Holocaust survivor and have seen it all. Doesn't prevent Jewish from becoming Nazis. Nazis became Nazis because Nazi ideology and not because they were Germans. Actually, they were Nazis of many nationalities as well. Jews can become Nazis, in my opinion. I may be right or wrong, but in my opinion, the opinion of very many people in Israel headed by Professor Leibovitch, some Jews did become Nazis. Well, if, you call, if you define Nazis, someone who denies the truth, then you can call lots of people Nazis in this world. Uh, I then. All right, so this is the difference in definition, that is all. At least I will point that the term Jewish Nazis or Judeo-Nazis is very much in common in Israel, where I live most of my time, than it is used in here. Please. The first part, 
uh, the first part of the question, which I will try to answer at some length, yes, I am paraphrasing now, is about Jewish tradition and how Jewish tradition can influence the Israeli politics, although uh, a proportion, I will explain what, uh, a, pro a high proportion, as the question is said, of the uh, Jews in Israel are, uh, are not religious or not orthodox. And the second the example that the questioner who said that he's orthodox brought an example of a group which, uh, uh, of a Jewish ambulance service called Hatsala, which I, of course, highly value, which runs an uh, ambulance service in New York and answer to every call. I will answer the, first, the second question first. Much as I value Hatzalah, I have to point to you that the daily situation in Israel is different. For example, not only that uh, uh, ambulance of uh, the settlement center of Ofra in many recorded cases uh, is not running on Sabbat in very famous case in which a uh, wall collapsed in a um, uh, over an uh, uh, Arab cafe in East Jerusalem, the ordinary uh, uh, Magen David, Red uh, Star of David ambulances arrived at once. It was a shocking case. Of, and this ambulance waited for, you hour, uh, for a few hours. Therefore, I am following the Israeli examples, which are well documented. I am very happy to learn that uh, Orthodox of New York uh, are better, uh, as you quote. This is uh, in, if it is security power problems, meaning Jews of New York feeling themselves weak and Jews in Israel feeling themselves strong, it may not be in your favor. I hope that on this point that, uh, that you are right in a deeper sense that some Orthodox rabbis about whom I never heard arose in New York and changed the ruling which I took from the standard text and from the Israeli practice of the last years. If so, uh, I would be very happy to learn about them. Now about the first part of your question. It is true that uh, all polls are showing that, uh, Jewish, uh, that Israeli Jews are divided into three major groups. One is Orthodox, one is called traditionalist in Hebrew Mesorati, I will explain, and one is secular. We can have various polls, but the usual opinion is that they are 20% orthodox, 40% secular, and 40% traditionalist, and 40% secular. Now, uh, traditionalists are people who keep very many of uh, Jewish Orthodox traditions, but who violate it also in other, w in other ways. The standard Israeli expression, or again a joke, is that those are people who are feeling, keeping kosher home. This obviously will be a requirement. Then uh, going to synagogue every Saturday morning, and then afternoon going to see our sports playing, which are played our afternoon. In politics, traditionalists will be for uh, laws based on tradition. It was, I, could, uh, I will not enter into party manipulation due to this law by which uh, import of, uh, of non-kosher meat was prohibited by the Knesset, but in electoral sense, all the people of traditional persuasion and some seculars too pers uh, have supported it because they said, if I want to eat non-kosher meat, I can do it abroad when I'm traveling abroad. Another version is says I can do it in a restaurant, but never in my home. But some, uh, some coercion must be in interest of Jewish tradition. Therefore, it is not only orthodox, I didn't attribute the power of uh, tradition to the Orthodox, but to the people generally, as I now explain in detail, who, while maybe violating some laws of Jewish tradition, nevertheless uphold it. Uh, in the same way, I have uh, very many people who will break many uh, Christian commandments will still apply Christian tradition or religion to the question of abortion. 
Explique. I will answer first, I de if I was, uh, I think you misunderstood me. I didn't say that organized Jews are actually said Israeli supporters because this applies as much, let's say, to Pat Robertson and to Jerry Falwell as it applies to any Jew, they have no right to express their opinion or to support Israel. I said that I advised you not to depend on their views because their support of Israel makes them compensate and therefore their opinion tends to be, in my opinion, tend to be very inaccurate and not by long experience. Uh, and the, but I certainly didn't deny their rights now, to express any opinion and, uh, at, uh, and, to, uh, and forever. I will expect, however, I will expect, however, that the opinions of, a, let's say, of of a person who will need, who will not weep about what is happening in Israel, to be more dependable on the average, who will weigh the situation in Israel and Middle East and Palestine coolly, to be more dependable than the person who will weep over what happening but still not go over there and carry his uh, conviction. My point was about his conviction. I think that an Israeli right-winger in Kiryat Arba, I may oppose him as very strongly, but I will not deny some of the things that I will not deny him is that he fully carries out his conviction. Those who are supporting the Kiryat Arba, let's say the supporters of Goldstein in New York, are not doing the same thing like the supporter of Goldstein in Kirat Arba. They are only giving money, and because of this, I found that even with the most extreme, let's say, Kahanist in Israel, you can carry a sort of argument, limited in extent, than with the same Kahanist in, uh, in New York, or when he is visiting Israel for a short time. And the same thing applies to every category, meaning you can 
a Likud supporter in Israel is, in my view, a much more interesting and valuable person to discuss than the, uh, than the person who supports the same view in the United States, and so on and on through uh, spectrum. And I advise you to go to the source. Now, uh, I ask your permission to say something about money before American money, before you will answer, elaborate on this. Uh, my, uh, you see, American money, in my opinion, going to Israel has uh, two great faults, uh, which are not uh, dependent on the point that I made and that Noam uh, Chomsky made, uh, that it is also used for indirectly for settlements, for uh, all kinds of aggressive politics. First of all, American money is only used, uh, only spent on the army. Uh, the so-called economic aid is not spent on Israeli economy. I mentioned that guarantees have not been used. The economic aid is spent on to repay the debts of our acquiring weapons. What it means? It means that Israeli army is supported about half and half, half by taxpayer money and half by money coming from the United States, which means in turn that the government is in this very important respect not dependent fully on the taxpayers and it is more full, more uh, uh, it is uh, more powerful than it should be. Second, it means something that we in Israel are calling militarization of Israeli society and economy, which means simply that many people, not at all of my opinion, are considering that the army is now too great for the Israeli security means. Uh, the sign of this overgrowth is that by now, in the last budget, from the Israeli taxpayer money, if we take only the half spent by Israel, 58% of the Israeli army budget is spent on uh, salaries and pensions, while in 1967 the corresponding figure is 1961, which means that in addition to everything, it is my opinion and, and opinion of people who are not uh, in the same opinion about Palestinians, that actually American support may make the Israeli army larger, but it is a, quite a question when it may make, make it stronger. Please. Uh, first, the sort of a side question on this undercurrent that keeps running through about the right of people, say in the United States, to criticize policies elsewhere where Americans don't directly suffer from them. It's a possible position that you might take. And if you took it seriously, you would be writing endless denunciations of everyone in the press and the intellectual community, all of whom are bitterly condemning Palestinians all the time, though they don't live in Palestinian refugee camps. Uh, you would use it to criticize uh, anyone in the United States who, like me, for example, who condemned the policy of the Soviet Union. I mean, I didn't live there, but I certainly condemned their policies. Uh, in fact, I only hear this in one case. Namely, you're not allowed to criticize the policies of the state of Israel unless you live there. You're allowed to criticize anything else. You know, you're allowed to criticize Stalinism. You're allowed to criticize Saddam Hussein. You're allowed to criticize the PLO. You're allowed to criticize anybody, even though you don't live there. But one exception holds. Now, I, have a, I think there's a name for that. It's racism, and we should accept that. I think everyone has a perfect right. Uh, everyone has a perfect right. I'm talking about you. Everyone has a perfect right. I, well, maybe I misunderstand you, but I thought that's what you were saying. Anyway, in any event, maybe we agree. Everyone has a perfect right to criticize any policies anywhere that they think are wrong. OK, now, in the case of the, in, in my, in, uh, referring to the economy, uh, if the United States were to give a, uh, the, the I'm, I'm strongly, I, I gave two examples of opposition to aid to Israel. Two. Uh, one of them was quoting Human Rights Watch, the major international human rights monitor, which pointed out that U.S. aid to Israel is flatly illegal by U.S. law. Uh, it's not the first time that's been pointed out. They just reiterated again. So let me repeat. I'm quoting Human Rights Watch, major international human rights monitor, who pointed out, which is correct, 
that, you, uh, that uh, U.S. law is directly violated by every dollar spent in aid to Israel because that law states explicitly that n no aid can be dish given except under special conditions which don't apply to countries which systematically carry out torture uh, and abuse of the populations under their control, including their citizens. And then they proceed to document in hundreds of pages, as B'Tselem has done in Israel and as other human rights investigators have done, that this is indeed true of Israel. So therefore, one comment about USAID to Israel, which I made and which I repeat at your request, uh, is that all, it's all illegal for that reason alone. Uh, a second comment that I made about aid to Israel had to do with the indirect aid that comes from the tax-free status uh, of the grants that are used uh, in Israel itself, incidentally, uh, to, uh, for the benefit of people of, Jew of Jewish race, religion, and origin. I, uh, remember, that's U.S. taxpayers who are paying that because that's tax deductible. A tax deductible gift means it's spread across the population by elementary logic. So I'm opposed to that kind of taxes. I don't think that, say, my taxes should be used within the state of Israel uh, to pay for uh, development, to pay for the following situation. So let me describe it inside Israel, not outside. Under the territories, of course, it's much worse, but I'm talking about the state of Israel itself. Uh, within that state, 92% of the land uh, is under the administration of an organization which, if you sort of work out through the whole complicated uh, ad ad traces, it's in print if you like, and I'll refer you to them. In fact, it turns out to be run by the JNF, the Karen K. Yemen. Uh, they have the, you know, it's designed, the laws are designed so that they have the governing position, the land administration, and they are by law, by their contract with the state, uh, restricting in the use of their funds to people of Jewish race, religion, and origin. The same is true of development funds. Development funds are funded by the state of Israel through these quasi-governmental institutions which have similar conditions and which are paid for by U.S. taxpayers. Uh, and that leads to the result that you have just vast differences in, uh, in say, sewage, education, uh, services, and so on between a Jewish village and a Palestinian village right next to each other within Israel. And I'm opposed to that kind of aid. Uh, with regard to the uh, scale of aid to Israel, as I, I didn't really criticize it, but if you'd like, I will criticize it. Uh, I will criticize it because, for several reasons. For one thing, uh, because what the aid is, first of all, because of its scale, and secondly, because of what it goes for. So I will add my, I haven't made that criticism, but I will make the criticism. I'll add it to my criticism, the huge amount of aid we give to Colombia, uh, more than half of the military aid in the continent, uh, and it happens to be the leading human rights violator uh, in the continent. Uh, in fact, U.S. aid happens to correlate very closely with torture. Uh, that's been demonstrated over and over. Uh, the more a country tortures its citizens, the higher it's likely to get U.S. aid within our domains. Uh, I opposed U.S. aid to Saddam Hussein for years, for years, before anybody was willing to talk about it or even report it. You will find in cases that I'm perhaps the only one who even reported some of this. Uh, and I opposed it because I opposed what he was doing, even though I didn't live in Iraq. And I opposed it because I don't want U.S. aid to go to Saddam Hussein, uh, even though George Bush and James Baker and so on thought it was a great idea. Uh, and in the case of Israel, I don't want, uh, first of all, the aid notice is not on the scale of the rest of US, aid, of U.S. or for that matter, anybody's aid. There is no country in the world that gets a fraction of the aid per capita that goes to Israel from the U.S. taxpayer. It's in, an, it's in a corner by itself. Uh, it's vastly in advance of Marshall Plan aid to Europe. It just is not in the same ballpark. And I should say that Marshall Plan aid to Europe uh, if you really look at it, it, most of it was aid from U.S. taxpayers to U.S. corporations. So, for example, $2 billion out of the $13 billion of Marshall Plan aid to Europe went straight to the American oil companies uh, as part of the effort to sort of shift Europe over from a coal to an oil-based economy. But I won't even proceed with that uh, because whatever you think about Marshall Plan aid, it is so minuscule as compared to the aid we're giving to Europe, to Israel per capita, that it doesn't uh, enter. Uh, as for where USAID ought to go, I don't think it ought to go to rich people. There's a small amount of, uh, the, the, uh, Israel is one of the richest countries in the world. It's in a higher level of wealth. It happens to be extremely unequal, 
it has one of the highest levels of inequality in the world, right after the United States, in fact. Uh, but it's also, uh, uh, but it's also a very wealthy country. It's it's one of it's the first world. Now, I don't think that there are 11 million children dying every year, uh, according to uh, UNICEF, from easily treatable diseases, meaning a couple of cents a day. Uh, I might add personal cases even uh, in my own close experience. Uh, but there are uh, 11 million children are dying every year from what the World Health Organization calls a silent genocide. Uh, that's where I'd like to see the aid going, not to rich countries. Not, well, you asked, me, you asked me why I'm criticizing the aid, right? That's why I'm criticizing. I'm going because the aid is being given to rich people to buy guns so they can oppress other people, to buy land, uh, to, to racist programs of the kind that I described, and not being given to 11 million children a year who are dying, of, uh, who are dying because a couple of cents a day would be required to give them salt. You know, so they don't get diarrhea. That's what I'm criticizing. And in fact, we can come right here in the United States, the Bo city of Boston, where we live, uh, which is one of the richest cities in the world and maybe the world's leading medical center. Uh, happens, to have a, happens to have a hospital downtown, uh, which serves the population, not you know, the rich folk, uh, the Boston City Hospital. And they, a couple of years ago, had to establish a malnutrition clinic. Why? because they were for the first time beginning to see third world levels of malnutrition. Uh, in, this is the richest country in the world, unparalleled advantages. Uh, right a couple of miles from us, there are children with third world levels of malnutrition. Uh, the United States has, uh, the, there are two areas in the world where hunger has increased in the past several decades. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and the United States, the richest country in the world. And it's increased to enormous levels. It's now estimated, a couple of years ago, it was estimated about 30 million people. There is no other wealthy country that even comes close to that. And many third world countries don't. So if we're going to give aid, there are plenty of people we can give aid to. Not to people, I'm, I'm incidentally exactly as much opposed, and you can find this in print, to the aid that we give to Saudi Arabia. Uh, not only because it's a brutal and tyrannical regime, but also because that aid happens to be aid from U.S. taxpayers to U.S. corporations. And in fact, if we actually trace back the so-called aid to Israel, a lot of it is exactly the same kind. So the part of the aid that goes to high-tech weaponry, uh, a substantial part of that is what keeps places like MIT going. That is, it's aid to, from the American taxpayer to uh, the wealthy in the United States, funneled through uh, the Pentagon system, which was designed in large part as a technique to, you know, to make sure that the poor subsidize the rich. And I'm very much opposed to that, including the cases where it's called foreign aid. Uh, so for example, a lot of the military aid that we go to Israel goes, that doesn't leave New York banks. You know, it gets transferred to another account, namely the account of the US military producers. And there's all kinds of spin-offs to that, like computers and electronics uh, and virtually every aspect of the functioning economy and that I've been criticizing for years, contrary to USAID Israel, which I don't bother talking about much. It's you know, a horrible thing, in my opinion, but small potatoes. Uh, uh, similarly, when the, US, uh, uh, sells arms, say, when the U.S. sells jet planes to Israel, part of the purpose of that is export promotion, or when it gives jet planes to Israel. Part of the purpose is export promotion. If the U.S. gives jet planes to Israel, they will then be able to sell the, uh, you know, not as good, but at relatively advanced and very expensive jet planes to Saudi Arabia, which is one of the standard techniques of recycling oil profits and making sure that the profits from Middle Eastern oil come right back here, not to the people of the region. Yes, I'm opposed to all of that. I'm opposed to aid to Israel which goes for those purposes. So if my feeling about aid is it should not be, first of all, it shouldn't be illegal. Like we, I think the American law on this point is to the point, we should not be giving aid to countries with slaughter and their citizens or torture their citizens. So not to Colombia, not to Israel. In fact, not to most of the countries we give it to because as I said, USAID happens to be correlated very well with torture. Uh, I'm not saying that for the first time. I've been saying it you know, all my articulate life, many decades. Uh, and uh, with regard to aid to, uh, to what is called foreign aid, it ought to be given to people who need it. That means not to rich people, but to suffering people. 
Uh, there's plenty of them here. There are many suffering much worse in the third world, and that's where our aid should be going, not to rich people to keep them rich. Uh, furthermore, we should not be giving aid for oppression. We should not be giving aid for uh, uh, keeping 92% of the land of a country uh, in the hands of a particular subset of citizens, namely those of Jewish race, religion, and origin. Same with development funds. Uh, we should uh, not be giving aid to buy weapons. We should be giving aid to build hospitals. Uh, if we were doing those things, I'd be in favor of aid. Uh, I also made another comment about USAID, namely, it is the most miserly in the developed world, and that is intended as a criticism. Uh, and furthermore, if we take off the, what's called aid to Israel, uh, this huge component of it, uh, which shouldn't be called aid at all because it's going to a wealthy country for the wrong, for harmful and destructive purposes, then that little bit that's left puts us totally off the spectrum. Okay, there's a criticism of foreign aid. So I have plenty of criticisms of it, uh, and I will continue to make those criticisms, and I think they're accurate. Let me take another one, another question, because after the announcement, it is all right. Please raise your voice. I don't hear. I would, it is on purpose that I quoted discrimination done to Israeli colonels and of course other soldiers and to point up that discrimination is done to people who fought in Israeli arms, wars, and that are still discriminated and therefore all who people who oppress other Palestinians are still discriminated and because of this you cannot really explain, in my opinion, or if you can, I don't accept your, uh, your argument, that discrimination is done for reasons of security. There are quite enough 
uh, cases in which the reason actually increases in security. If a, a Palestinian soldier and the number of Palestinian soldiers who serve in Israeli um, army is increasing. By the way, this is due to Likud. It was the Likud Defense Minister Moshe Arens who opened the Israeli army in 1990 to volunteers of all religion. It was the labor government, which until that time uh, prohibited Muslims, except Druzes and Bedouins, to serve in the army. So you can count it a sign of progress. But even after this, people who serve in the Israeli army are discriminated. Therefore, it cannot be security. Then Israeli wars. Obviously, its last Israeli war, the invasion of Lebanon, was purely a war of aggression and was not, uh, a, uh, was not motivated by any security. In the same way, I will say that the War of Suez 56, uh, another example in which Israel and, uh, allied itself with Britain and France in order to invade uh, Nasser and to topple uh, Egypt and topple Nasser regime, it was done for ideological or maybe also imperialistic reasons, but not done for security. In many other uh, ways, it can be shown that wars in general, there are exceptions, of course, there are, I am not speaking about the first war in 47, 49, whose uh, causes were complex in many ways, but further Israeli wars had mostly reasons which had not to do with security. I accept your uh, point about hatred. I actually didn't say in my presentation that Israeli Jews hate Palestinians or that uh, the discrimination is um, inflicted out of hatred. They are, of course, haters, but, there's, uh, uh, but their number is small. And they don't, and those who, let us say, worship Baruch Goldstein or Rabbi Elba, don't influence Israeli policy. I didn't quote them except when answer and after some provocative question, but I think that it is that both in the Jewish case and in the case of all other uh, groups which initiate uh, horrifying policies, let us say, in case of uh, Arab states who initiated, uh, ho most of Arab states which initiated horrifying policies also, but all other states, it was not hatred. It was ideology. Ideology doesn't mean hatred. Ideology, if you will look, let us say, I will now specially take a far away example, the inquisitors. We know very much about the inquisitors. They wrote books and letters and people wrote about them. I think no serious scholar will say that the inquisitors were um, moved to burn people alive by hatred. They considered that the good of religion and also the good of society consists in so harming a minority for the great benefit of the rest. And the, I am also saying to you that those people who, as is my end of my presentation, support Jewish tradition over democracy and therefore discrimination, are in the main not motivated by hatred, are motivated by the same reasons, which is usually not hatred, which motivated other regimes and other groups to discriminate against uh, other groups for uh, because they believed, they truly believed in, in a bad ideology that they, had, uh, they adopted. And I will say further that in, all, in most of the cases, ideological oppression, which caused in so many cases, I mentioned Inquisition, the adoption of a system of regime which, of which Inquisition was a part ruined Spain, which was before this a very flourishing country. Adoption of ideology, which then initiated a bad policies, of course, first brings harms of the uh, enormous harm and suffering of the oppressor. But I try to show, and now in answer to your question, I will bring uh, be explicit that, in my opinion, adoption of this ideology and of this discrimination will also bring calamity on us. I mean, you may differ, of course, 
with from this estimate, but this is at least my opinion. Yes, it, you are right that the ideology of Inquisition in case of many heretics was to bring the, the heretic to paradise. And if not this heretic, by this example of saving others from paradise. I say it with full understanding, also of course with full enmity. The, uh, the bad ideologies in most cases are not designed to cause harm, I agree. It is, uh, but they still are bad and cause suffering and discrimination. Uh, I was asked a narrow question, but if you don't mind, I'll take the opportunity to make a comment about another one, which actually is related to what I was talking about. You said that uh, Israel, Israel wants nothing more than to make peace with its neighbors, which is certainly true. But remember that that's universal. Everybody wants peace. Like Hitler wanted peace and Mahatma Gandhi wanted peace, and everybody wants peace. The question is, what kind of peace? Now, when you said make peace with their neighbors, something is being slipped under the rug there. Uh, Israel has always wanted to make peace with the states of the region. It has always wanted that. So, for example, to take what's been more or less official Israeli policy since 1968, the Alon Plan, uh, it was uh, designed to make peace with the states of the region, uh, and to keep Israel in control of substantial parts of the Gaza Strip, of the West Bank. At that point, it was 40 percent. It's now, what, 75 percent or something. Uh, 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 and uh, substantial parts of the Gaza Strip. And yes, that's what Israel's always wanted. It's wanted to make peace with the surrounding states, but excluding the Palestinians. The Palestinians are to be, as the, far, the doves in the Foreign Office said in 1948, uh, either to be dispersed or to join, uh, to become uh, uh, human dust and waste and join the most impoverished masses in the, uh, in the Arab society. And that remains the case. The current peace agreement is tailored to Israeli demands. It's exactly the demand. I mean, you know, things have changed a little bit if you look at the borders. So the borders of today are not precisely those of the Alon plan. Uh, nor, but if you go from the Alon plan in 1968, that's sort of the left, up to the Sharon plan of 1992, which is the far right, you will notice that they are all essentially the same. They include, in fact, they're the same to remarkable detail. They always include friendly relations with all the other states uh, and the territories remaining under Israeli control. With one exception, they all say that they don't want to have responsibility for the dense Arab population areas. They want them to be either stateless or administered by someone else, so Israel doesn't have to worry about them. But they want most of the usable land, they want the resources, uh, uh, they want, uh, uh, by now it amounts to, well, like 75% of the West Bank and about 30% of the Gaza Strip, uh, uh, most of the water and so on. That's what they want, but not responsibility for the citizens. That's the kind of peace that has been wanted from right after the June war up until today, and that's the kind that's been achieved. That's a kind of peace, but as I say, everyone wanted peace for, in a range including Mahatma Gandhi to Hitler. Question is, what peace? Uh, and this- They wanted the same kind of peace when, when the West Bank was still in, okay? They wanted the same kind of peace when the Palestinians had their own state. Absolutely, as long as the Palestinians got nothing, Israel was perfectly happy about it. Absolutely. Israel's, posi Israel's position from, in fact, if you want, we can go back to the origins of Zionism. You want to go back to the origins of Zionism? Yeah, oh, let's go back to 19, let's go back to the First World War, when uh, Chaim Weizmann, the leader of the Zionist movement, uh, wrote in internal documents, which have now been publicized, uh, that the British had informed him that there are several hundred thousand Negroes living in Palestine, but that's a matter of no significance. Uh, and uh, we can go on, you know, right from there up to the present, if you like. Uh, but yes, their position has always been that the indigenous population have no rights. Uh, and that is... What are you talking about? Uh, Palestinians were Jordanian citizens. Please. The Palestinians... Bef the Pal First of all, they were not. The Palestinians who were in... If the, the, the Palestinians in the, to, to the west of the Jordan, which is the relevant part, uh, were the ones who have been dispossessed. Uh, some of them are in the state of Israel. Where they, 
No, I'm not. I'm answering exactly your question. The, look, the state, these are people, there is an area in Cisjordan, meaning west of the Jordan onto the, on, onto the sea, and Israel's position with regard, may I continue? You, look, you, you get a hall and you give a speech. There's a position of, there's Cisjordan, which is the Jordan up to the sea, and Israel has had a fairly standard position with regard to that for a long time, back to the days when they were told by the British there were a couple hundred thousand Negroes there, but it didn't matter. Uh, the idea is that these couple of thousand, hundred thousand Negroes basically have no rights in the country where they live. Now, Israel wants, it wants to take that country, or large parts of it, uh, take control of its resources, establish a state which is a state for the, it's not a, it's not a state for its citizens, notice, it's the sovereign state of the Jewish people. Like it's my state, but not the state of an Arab citizen in, living in Israel in Umar Fakhem. And that, that's what they wanted to do. Uh, it's changed over the years. Like, for example, what we call the West Bank happens to be half of the, Pal the original Palestinian state. Uh, the other half was simply taken over by Israel and annexed. Nobody even talks about that half. And that was furthermore done in collusion with Jordan. Uh, there was an agreement back then to, divide, to partition the Palestinian state in 1948, and that's pretty much what happened. Uh, coming up to the present, the reason why the United States, why Israel has been able to pursue and in fact now achieve its completely rejectionist program is because you and I pay for it. Uh, it's been U.S. policy. U.S. policy has agreed with Israel that the Palestinians have no right in their original country. Only Israeli Jews do. That's the rejectionist half of the diplomacy that I was describing. Uh, and yes, in that sense, the U.S. is quite willing to make peace. Now, turning about the factory, yeah? Why did it make a difference to Israel when the West Bank was under Jordanian control? They always intended to take it. They always, look, you read Ben-Gurion's diaries. Read Ben-Gurion's diaries. What he said is, they did not. First of all, they didn't, well. For, furthermore, I, it, look, you, I, I would suggest that you learn the history. You can start with Ben-Gurion's diaries. I mean, we can go way back if we like, but let's go to 1948 when he said, uh, you know, this is a base for, for 37 when the Peel Commission report was uh, first gave the first partition. Ben-Gurion said, look, we'll take whatever small state they give us, but we'll continue to conquer. We will continue to conquer, and ultimately we'll have a huge state. And in fact, if you look at the boundaries he had in mind, they included southern Lebanon, southern Syria, uh, each, you know, Sinai up to El Arish. I mean, they were all over the place. So the, uh, this is the, found, the, you know, the, the founder of the state. Uh, since then, ambitions have been slightly modified and the policy slightly changed, but the essence remains the same. Uh, the indigenous population don't have any rights. Uh, going back to the earliest records, Chaim Weizmann, there's a couple hundred thousand Negroes and their situation is of no significance up till 1948 when the Foreign Office says uh, they are human dust and they will disperse among the waste of society up until the present uh, when they are not to have the rights of national self-determination in any part of their original territory. But yes, Israel's delighted to make peace with its neighbors and always has been as long as the Palestinians are out of it. Uh, turning to the factories, uh, the, uh, the question you asked was a rather odd one, uh, and let me re see if I got it straight, because uh, it sounded really strange to me, and I don't want to mis misstate you. I described an incident, I described the case of the U.S. toy manufacturing industry, although this is a parable, I could have talked about a lot more. It happens to be primarily located in places like southwestern China and Thailand and so on, where, to give the example I mentioned, uh, Hundreds of people in the last several months, in the last year or so, uh, have been burned to death in factories, mostly women, incidentally, because they're the easiest exploitable, burned to death in factories where they were locked in. Okay? Now, your question was, well, am I saying they shouldn't have any factories at all? Is that right? Is that what you said? Yeah, okay. So the choices you are putting forward are the following either we build torture chambers and crematoria or else we don't have anything. And I don't think those are the only two choices. Well, I agree. Then therefore you misstated the question. So now let's state the question properly. All, you mean? 
No, I did not. That's your conclusion. Actually, I probably would say something like that, but that's your <laughs> conclusion. Uh, and I would say it, but I, I would only say it after documenting it. I wouldn't give it as a blanket comment. So I talked about a specific case, namely the toy industry and people and all of us who are going to buy toys for Christmas. And I pointed out that those toys are mostly being produced in horror chambers, in places where people are literally mostly women, locked into factories, and then burned to death if the factory happens to go on fire. Now, this is true everywhere. So like, take, say, Haiti. OK, I was in Haiti not about a year ago. Uh, and uh, in, in Haiti, uh, where there was incidentally no embargo, there was mostly fraud. The US broke it right through. Uh, in Haiti, you find, say, uh, it, um, a lot of American sports equipment comes from there, like softballs and things, uh, bought by the federal government, incidentally, right in the middle of the so-called embargo. Uh, they were being be produced by, uh, by mostly women again, working in factories for five to 10 cents an hour, 12-hour uh, days, uh, no toilet facilities, and so on. Uh, dipping their hands into unprotected, into toxic substances so that the manufacturers can advertise, as they do here, the American manufacturers, that their softballs are specially good because they're specially bonded. Yeah, they're specially bonded because the women working for five to ten cents an hour are putting their hands into toxic substances. Well, is the choice either that or nothing? No. Furthermore, when we try to build factories there, who are we doing it for? Are we doing it for the Mevs family, the super rich family that owns these places? Or are we doing it for people like somebody I interviewed when I was in Haiti? So one of the people I interviewed, in fact, I, I was there to talk to people who were underground, you know, priests in hiding. This is really a period of the really bad repression. Priests in hiding, you know, uh, uh, activists hiding out somewhere and so on. One of the guys I talked to was, in fact, one of the leading labor leaders in Haiti. Uh, he's a man who I happened, he was sort of limping around when I saw him. He had just been in police custody uh, where he'd been practically beaten to death uh, uh, because he tried to make a statement on a radio. Uh, but he's a brave man. He was willing to talk in public with Haitian police, meaning mur murderers who we you and I trained and paid for around there, uh, ready to go after him. And uh, he was condemning those factories. Now, and you can find the same all through Southeast Asia. You, so you say in Indonesia, where wages are half the level of China, that is twice as bad as what I've just described, uh, there's, a, there's a lively labor movement trying to rectify these policies. And you and I, at least if you're an American citizen, certainly me, are paying taxes which are blocking that, which are paying the security forces that are killing them. Our president is going to go there in two weeks, and he has already announced that he will say nothing about human rights practices. So nothing about the Indonesian workers who are trying to overcome these conditions. So the choice is not, as you put it, do we build torture chambers or nothing? The choice is, do we interact with the world in a way that a human being wouldn't be ashamed of? Yes, first of all, it did have a great effect. Only the emigration has ceased about two years ago. The emigration, um, uh, and uh, uh, by the way, to add to comment of Noam Chomsky, the two billion uh, of guarantees are actually now uh, sitting in a Swiss bank and bearing 7%. Uh, uh, bearing 7% because the emigration has stopped. But it is very true that the emigration has caused two effects. One, that most of those people are uh, secular, and it is very true that some of them are not Jews, and some of them uh, uh, have now, are now uh, living a religious life in Greek Orthodox uh, Church. But yes, there, is, there, are now, uh, there are now two churches in Israel who call themselves Jewish Christian churches. One is the Greek Orthodox, that's another Catholic church who say mass in Hebrew and regard themselves as Jewish Catholics, but I don't know what the ideology and government uh, will do with this. Uh, but there is another factor which they cost. They are very poor by now, because Mr. Rabin happens to be the prime minister who is the most devoted 
to the economic ideas of Mr. Reagan more than I would say Mr. Shamir before him and more before um, uh, any other prime minister. Let me just point in substantiation of the fact that during two and uh, years and few months that Mr. Rabin is prime minister, the average price, price of housing in Israel rose by 56%. Uh, imagine such a thing happening in... Uh, because of this, you have a conflict between the, their secularity and their being objective. Well, standard scholarly works, and he points out there that up until the time he wrote, I forget what year it was, he says all of Israel's capital formation came from external sources, meaning uh, basically the United States, very, a little bit from German reparations, but primarily the United States. And that was long before the major uh, contributions. That was before U.S. so-called aid to Israel shot up in the 70s. In 1978, uh, Jimmy Carter raised it to literally 50% of total U.S. aid. Uh, in fact, if you cut out U.S. aid, uh, the, the United States happens to have, be, have the, the most miserly record in the developed world in foreign aid. That's literally the case. Uh, but if you cut out the aid to Israel, a rich country, the U.S. isn't even there. It's kind of like around Zambia in absolute terms. Uh, and, uh, uh, this, uh, but, and this is a huge flow of aid. There is no country in the world that gets a fraction of it. Uh, sometimes Israel's called it like a state of the union, but that's wrong because there is no state of the union that even gets a fraction of the uh, uh, contribution that comes from the taxpayer to the state of Israel, and that's an enormous factor in their, uh, in, in their economic growth. As I say Safran called it equivalent to entire capital formation. Uh, that, that's why Israel's a rich country. There's been a request for people to ask their questions from the first step, that way they can be on the video and audio. By the way, Nadav Safran uh, uh, had a, hosted a conference uh, on, on, behalf of, on behalf of the CIA. Stay, stay the in the line if you're going to make a stand, please. It's a, just a side light about Nadav Safran. Yeah. Yeah. Can you guys hold on? <laughs> Yes. States and Israel were the two voting against. Um, you didn't allude to who may or may not have abstained, but that's not important. Uh, the point is that uh, the sanctions and condemnations against Israel, uh, that basically, um, what kind of moral yardstick do you think the United Nations is when basically it's just a body of delegates uh, selected by non-democratically chosen governments, driven obviously by self-interest and not moral altruism? So how can we really judge Israel or any other country based up against moral uh, based up against the United Nations resolution. That's the first question. The second one is you argue that the rich lifestyle of the Israeli society is essentially supported by uh, the United States taxpayer. Uh, we know that it's something like $3 billion a year that the United States supplies to Israel. That's about $600 per capita, enough maybe to buy a Nintendo, a nice stereo system, if you're not spending it on, de on defense-related uh, costs. Um, the economy in Israel uh, is about $70 billion. It's growing at about 7% per year. I really don't see how that's uh, more than just a small subsidy at this point in time, and it continues to uh, erode with time as well. Um, how can you argue that the Israeli economy is totally dependent on Israel's support? Those are my two questions. Uh, well, the, as far as the United Nations is concerned, there were uh, countries that abstained, uh, all of whom condemned the United States. Uh, and we don't have to worry about the UN. We can ask about countries like Canada, England, uh, and so on, and ask what their opinion is. I don't know if they're democratic by your standards, uh, but if they are, uh, they bitterly condemned uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, embargo, and indeed, so did George Bush. In fact, when the uh, Torricelli bill, which is what they're talking about, this bill which was designed to increase the embargo and to cut out about 90 percent of what it cut out was out of food and medicine, uh, it was vetoed by George. It was proposed by the Liberal Democrats. It was vetoed by George Bush. The reason being it was so obviously contrary to international law that George Bush was opposed to it. 
uh, when it came up in the United Nations, it was, it, he passed it anyway because he was outflanked from the right by Clinton during the uh, 1992 election. So they passed it. Uh, it was a, immediately condemned by uh, the Democratic, by our Democratic allies, two votes, the United States and El Salvador, uh, uh, agreeing, uh, objecting to obeying international law. Uh, the second time it came, the U.S. was able to pick up one vote, Israel. And if you want, if we had time, I'd go on and on. Now, you know, if your standards are that the only expression of decent human opinion is the state of Israel and the U.S. government, yeah, you have a position. If it's anyone else, if well, if it includes, for example, the uh, votes of Canada, England, France, uh, other uh, Germany, on and on, uh, saying, say, that you should uphold international law, if it includes the world court, then you're, I'm afraid you're off the wall. On the second issue, uh, if you want, uh, first of all, the $600 a year is absolutely not true. U.S. subsidies to Israel amount to, at the very minimum, $1,000 per capita. Israel gets more from, and that's at the minimum, if we don't consider subsidiary costs. So like, for example, one subsidiary cost, which is not counted, uh, is uh, contributions to Israel. Uh, you can give money to the Jewish National Fund in the United States and the United Jewish Appeal, and that's tax deductible, meaning everybody in the country pays for it. And that money goes for the kinds of things that Israel Shachak was talking about. For example, if you look at the contract of the Jewish National Fund with the State of Israel, uh, originally signed in 1953 and then renewed, what it says is that, that the money that they spend can be used, I'm quoting, for people of Jewish race, religion, and origin only. Okay, that's you, American taxpayers are therefore paying quite substantial sums to the state of Israel uh, for actually to, an, to a quasi-official agency. Uh, Israel likes to farm out these activities so that they don't literally fall under the government, uh, which is then used for the benefit of people of Jewish race, religion, and origin. And we can go on with that. If you want an authoritative uh, analysis of the effect of this uh, from a very pro-Israeli scholarly source, uh, you can turn to uh, down the river to Nadav Safran. Uh, I guess he's originally Israeli, judging by, I don't know if he is or not. He's an is Israeli scholar who uh, was a major uh, Middle East scholar who wrote one of the sort of standard works on uh, the United States and Israel, I should say, by the Western Hemisphere, of course. Uh, the British ambassador, who is usually at the UN, who's usually so loyal to the United States, he practically, you know, I suspect he gets handed his messages from Washington. He got up and bitterly condemned it, though finally they abstained. They don't like to step on the toes of the United States that openly. Uh, so in fact, world opinion on this goes from, includes, say, Britain, Canada, you know, George Bush, and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, but we do we do know we do know what the well, we do know the voting record, and we do know what our allies, uh, our democratic allies felt. They bitterly condemned it because it's so obviously contrary to international law. Okay, uh, that's uh, on on the on the case of uh, uh, on the case of the 101 to two vote. There was one country that was willing to stand up against all of world opinion on this, including the democratic societies, namely our. Uh, subsidized client. Uh, and that's true on case after case. Uh, for example, the United Nations uh, passed, the Security Council passed a resolution a few years ago calling on all states to, uh, to observe international law. They didn't mention any particular state in question, but everyone knew who they meant. It was right after the World Court had ordered the United States to stop its uh, Ill, it's, as they put it, unlawful use of force, meaning in uh, international terrorism against uh, Nicaragua. The U.S., of course, totally rejected the, uh, uh, the opinion. It then went to the Nicaragua and took it to the Security Council of the United Nations, uh, which voted uh, to call on all states to support international law. The U.S. vetoed it. It then went to the, uh, in, uh, to the uh, General Assembly, where there's technically no veto, uh, and uh, the General Assembly passed a resolution calling on all states to, uh, to uh, adhere to international law, mentioning no one, but the implication was understood. Excuse me a second. Excuse me a second. I, you asked your question, now I'm answering it. Uh, the U.S. was able to pick up one vote. Uh, well, actually, the first time it came, the U.S. was able to pick up 